I am joyful to be here with Rachel Martin. Um, her website is findingjoy.net. Is that right, Rachel? That is correct. Yeah. And yeah. I'll put the links below for sure. And um, yeah, I'm just, uh, Rachel, you have a fascinating story and you're also a successful entrepreneur and there are lots of tips and um, encouragement and, and perspective you can offer uh, those of us here watching this uh, fellow solo solopreneurs and entrepreneurs. So, um, and you know, we, we, we didn't talk about our, our dress, dress code beforehand, but it's perfect. It's <laughs> white and black. It's, and perfect. our backgrounds too. It's like, it's the perfect contrast here. <laughs> so it is so perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to begin with, well, the fact that you are a, a mother of how many kids? So I'm a, the biological mom of seven. Wow. And then I'm, wow. yeah, I'm a bonus mom to four oh my and then God. a mom in love now because I have, we have two of our kids that have gotten married and then we just thought our life was really dull. So we adopted a rescue puppy too. Amazing. So, actually cool. rescue dog. We think he's five. <laughs> yeah. 11, well, it's always going to be a puppy to you, right? Now, um, yeah. so 11 plus children. I mean, that, that is, uh, I, I always tell people like, I, I think, you know, mothers are superheroes because I, um, lived with my brother and, um, his, his now ex-wife, uh, mm -hmm. lived with them when their kids were one and two years old. Oh. And I lived with them for a summer and I did not know what I had coming for me. Cause I was like, after that summer, I'm like, I'm never having children. <laughs> I'm like, there's no way I'm having kids. They are monsters. They are, they are like, and that, and there's, they take so much energy, like energy vampires. Cause they, yes. it's, like, it's like one child is like, taking care of one child is like having a full-time job plus, you know, more than the full-time job. So the fact that you have 11, uh, uh, you know, and biological seven, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, really it's amazing. And um, you know, it was hard for you in the early days. Um, you naturally, you know, with finances, with, with mm -hmm. so many kids, um, what, what are their age ranges? Get, give me a sense of that. <laughs> it's hard so, for you to remember. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so no, no, it's, it's good that my youngest will be 15 real wow. soon and the oldest will be 28. So when I started mm -hmm. into the online realm, yeah. one the initial, especially like the blogging one, um, yes. my youngest wasn't even born. Wow. Okay. And then, so you really blogged through your whole journey because you started your blog in 2008. I and, have, I have. Yeah, I definitely yeah, have. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. So, so tell us about, so tell us about like your, your struggles with finances in the early years of having, having kids. How did you, and there's a, there's a, a wonderful video on your a short video. Um, you being interviewed on the today show mm -hmm. on, on your website. Um, I just saw that again. And so folks, you can check that out in the, in the link below where you talked about struggling with, you know, paying for gas. Like you had to pay like $3 for gas for, for your car gas. And, and, but you still kept everything to get you know, on the outside externally. It looked like you had everything together and people probably wouldn't have suspected it, but it was, it was a big financial struggle. So tell us about, and I, I know some people watching this either can relate to that or maybe mm -hmm. are in that right now. Um, any words of comfort, guidance, encouragement for those who have been there or are there rather? Well, I, first of all, you're not alone. I think that was the biggest misconception that I had during those years was I was the only one that got, that was dealing with like, just say the gas thing. Well, when that aired on the today show, the number of people that would message me saying the part where you talked about paying with change or paying $3 for gas, that's my life. And that was really eye-opening to me because part of my mission has been to talk about the spaces in life that we don't talk about, because I believe that when you don't talk about it, you, you prevent healing, you prevent a solution from happening. And so that there was so many of us in that spot with struggling with finances. And I think it's because finances become this kind of a source of identity. It's a source of shame. If you don't have your money figured out, then people, then there was this misconception of, well, that I would deal with, well, I'm not smart or I'm not good enough or all of that. And so then because of that, I didn't want to be perceived that way. I, I believe I'm, I'm fairly smart. I, I would hide. I, I worked so hard to keep the illusion that things were right. 
But instead of fixing it, I was working on the illusion. And you can't do both. You can't hold up the mask of everything's good and then, or else you have to take down the mask so that you can fix it. So for me in my first marriage, when the finances were really, really unbelievably rough, and I would say not rightly ordered, I, I spent so long trying to do what I thought I needed to do, be the good wife, be the good mom, keep everything together, but without actually fixing the problem. And so there came a day when I realized that if the finances didn't get fixed, I was basically teaching my kids that it was okay. It was acceptable to ignore this and to just try to keep going. And so a great part of my story was about three, four years into blogging, I, I, I started earning money and it started to open my eyes to the possibility that, you know what, I can earn money and I needed to change my, like my... I guess my thoughts on money, it was not something that was hard. It was something that was accessible, that money was an energy, that it was something that I could step into versus think there's, there's always going to be another shoe that's going to drop. That's wonderful uh, advice and encouragement. And um, now you have just give some quick context here, jump to the jump, jump to the now you have a million followers on Facebook or your Facebook page, which I will, of course, put that link below as well. That's extraordinary. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you also said that you blogged for three to four years before you started making money. Mm -hmm. That's also extraordinary because most people blog for three weeks and, <laughs> and then they don't make money. They're like, no, maybe three months. Okay. They don't make money. They're like, what's the point of this? Uh, it's not right. getting me clients. Um, I'm not getting any, you know, any, any, any comments even, right. That's discouraging um, too. So let's talk about that for a bit because lots of content creators here watching this mm -hmm. um, and those who are either wanting to have a career as a creator, or they're trying to grow their business through content. How did you have that staying power? Went back then, uh, blogging was an outlet for me. I didn't mm -hmm. have that idea that it was going to actually turn into what it could uh -huh. be. So for me uh -huh. in that moment, it was an outlet. Now I'll tell you, I didn't make money as in Google paying me $31 and 42 cents, which I do wish I had kept that check, <laughs> but I needed it back then. But I, sometimes I wish, oh, I wish I had that first check, but I did discover fairly early on that I could almost barter. I, because I was developing a voice and I was a homeschooling mom, then a lot of companies would say, Hey, would you write about our curriculum and we'll send it to you? And because I was in a financial bind, that became this very viable option for me to figure out how to use something that I liked, but also in some ways I was actually getting paid. And then that opened doors to, Hey, what if I put ads on my site and all of that? But I, I really think in the beginning, especially when you're starting, it's a discovery of your audience and it's a discovery of your own voice. Where does my audience reside with an intersection of something that I really am passionate about? And you can't, you can't rush that. It takes the kind of trial and error, ebb and flow. And then whenever you get that comment, being very grateful and listening to what they're saying. And that act of listening is what I really believe helped propel the blog forward and the Facebook page. It wasn't just me giving information. It was me listening. And then it was like a partnership of, oh, I hear this is what you're looking for. And then, then me thinking, does that intersect with my own passions and not just writing just to write, but writing in a space where it was mutually beneficial. I love this so much. I talk uh, often as often as I can about how marketing and creating content like it is the process of a business find or a creator finding their calling mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and it's a to me it's it's like a what a wonderful opportunity that not only are we building something that can become you know financially sustaining and thriving but at the same time we are just like you said discovering our voice and mm -hmm. finding that intersection of, you know, that, that quote, I always love from Frederick Buechner, you know, where God calls you to is where your, uh, where your um, talent meets, where your gifts meet the world's deep hunger. 
Mm. Paraphrase. It's beautiful. But yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah. We're always trying to find the sweet spot of that intersection. And that's what you um, were doing maybe intuitively, or you just cared. You had the empathy to say, mm -hmm. okay, let me really take in the comments. And now did you, um, when you started getting comments on your, mm -hmm. you know, blog, your Facebook, did you have conversations with those people? Like, were you able to actually connect with them or was it just like deeply reading into their comment? Like how, tell us a bit about that process. It's both. Even okay. today, it's mm -hmm. definitely both. I strive even with a million people to form a connection with the people that leave a comment specifically because I look at it this way. Everybody that leaves a comment is choosing to use 30 seconds, a minute, five minutes out of their window of 24 hours. And it would be a disservice of me to not show up for them, to not be like, thank you so much for coming in. Granted, I can't I can't comment to everybody. It's impossible now, but it really does make such an impact that there's a real person behind that page and all of that. And in the beginning, I definitely would have comments I, or conversations. I would, let's say something was shared by a midwife page and I would go and first of all, that would give me information. These are the people that are sharing my content. This is the people that it resonates with. Who are the people they're serving? And I always look another layer and then I would just be very authentic. I really appreciate you sharing. And then I would leave a comment that was responding to what they said, not a generic thing. If they said, you know, I'm really struggling with feeling like I'm enough, I would meet them there and say, I hear what you're saying. And then I've had that same struggle. And it was a dialogue versus me just preaching at them. Like I have all the answers because I knew I didn't. I knew that this whole journey was about not just me moving forward, but a group of us moving forward, trying to be the best that we could be. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I love that. I, this is inspirational to me as well, because um, uh, given that you know, you're a busy mother, you're still able to carve out enough time to do that. Um, I think <laughs> nobody else has an excuse, right? Um, so, but, but I do want to say a bit about like having young children or just having mm -hmm. kids at, at home and then carving out and then all the caretaking that you have to do and then still carving out enough time for your business for creating content i mean i i hear so many you know everybody has excuses oh mm -hmm. I, I i can't i couldn't create consistently because i'm caretaking mm -hmm. well do you have seven children plus four <laughs> you know <laughs> um do you right like, like, like there is no excuse anymore after this, uh, this interview. Um, so it's like, how do you, so yeah, talk to us about that. How did you, how were you able to carve out time for your creating, for your responding, for your building of your business, et cetera? Yeah. Well, a couple of things when I was really in the, like the fire was underneath me in those days, especially because I, I was determined to change my finances. And sometimes when you're in that spot of, you, there's, you just have to do it. So I look back and especially in the beginning days, there was this unbelievable courage that I had to try to figure it out and to just go with all in, all in. Um, but the other thing was, is I knew I was a better mom. I was a better entrepreneur. I was a better friend when I gave myself permission to do those things, to do the hard things. Is it always easy? Mm -mm. I'm going to first to tell you that there are so many times where you write something and I'm, I'd be like, this is amazing crickets and other times where it would be unexpected and it would go viral. And what I learned from it was to appreciate both of the times to appreciate, to understand like what, what was it in that one that made it go crickets? What was that? And what was the things that made this go viral and to pay attention to it and look at it more like a puzzle and an adventure and instead of allowing time or all the things to slow me down, it was just one of those things that I was going to figure out. And that, that mindset really, really helped me go forward. Um, Dan and I talk about uh, this uh, Randy Powell. She gave the last lecture uh, yes. and uh, Very we powerful. talk about he, yeah. Yeah, we, his thing with speed bumps in life, like um, Dan is my husband and we would teach this a lot too, that he, Randy Pausch, when he would see speed bumps, he would think of it as 
Most people think it's a stop, a place to stop the brick wall. I shouldn't go farther, but it really was to weed out the people that didn't want it as much. And I knew I wanted to figure this out. I, I, my entire life, I didn't quite fit into the corporate world. I, I always knew I, I had this space that didn't, I didn't know quite where I always fit. I always wanted to create. And this was an opportunity for me to step into who I was and I didn't want to give it up. So when I'd feel like, I don't know if I can do that, I, I would actually think to myself, would you want to sit at a desk and do that? Do you want to go back working retail? And the answer was so resoundingly no, that I would push through and do what I needed to do. I love that you were motivated by, um, you know, what you had experienced before. It's like, no, I'm not going back there. I'm, I'm moving mm-hmm. forward. Now, one of the, on this topic of creating, one of the challenges a lot of us have is, uh, you know, we might say perfectionism or just taking a long time to create, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and especially with people uh, like like you who are who are so short on time. Um, talk us through this a little bit because I, I hear people say, "Oh, it takes me four hours, eight hours plus to to write a blog post." And I'm like, mm-hmm. "Okay, that's fine mm-hmm. if it's if if you have you know." Well, if you have a million readers, <laughs> that's mm-hmm. like a maybe. But it's like for most of us, just starting from zero or starting with a few hundred readers or whatever, um, or just you know, 50, 50 people on an email list. I don't. My opinion is you can't you can't afford eight hours to write a blog post. I mean, you, right. you know, it's like so so. But 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 how do you? What do you say to somebody who says, "Well, I don't know. It just takes me a while to get into it, and then it's not good enough, and then I have." I mean. You know, you 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 started, and you 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 were there from the very beginning when when you mm-hmm. had a blog of, of zero readers, I assume. So, I did. how did you how did you keep yourself with good boundaries for not taking so much time creating each piece? Uh, a couple of things. Everybody starts at zero. I always remind people, even me, if I write yeah. something new and put it on Facebook, it's, it starts at zero, and you have good to be point. okay with starting at zero. Um, and it's not a definer, it's just a starting place. But if you don't actually publish it, you won't even get to say you started at zero and that you could spend forever, like trying to get it perfect in the beginning with my blog, I actually, for about a year made a commitment to try to write every day. And a lot of times it was just, it was a real blog that those journals at that point. And in that process of sharing every day, which you could do on social too. I ended up discovering my voice, what resonated and what really, what didn't work, but you can't, you can't be perfect. If you're doing it every single day, you have to be willing to say, this is good enough. And I give an example of my one daughter, uh, grace, she's in the military now, but when she was in high school, she came to me and she said, you know, mom, a 93 a percent a is the same as a 99 percent a at the end of the day and it was so profound to me that she 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 even in her high school probably not wanting to get all the way but she knew that back then what she needed to do to get things done fast forward to when she's in boot camp and she had this physical test and she knew that in order to pass it she could only do the minimum of the sit-ups because if she did all of them, then she'd be too tired for the rest. And I thought that's a level of discernment that we need in business too, is the ability to say, this is good enough. Now, to make it even more interesting, the things that I've written that have gone the most viral have not been written in eight hours. In fact, one of them was written in about 22 minutes. Um, It was just my heart. I just wrote and then I hit publish. And would I go back and change things now? Probably, but if I did, I don't think it would have gone viral because I think it would have been too, too perfectly packaged and people needed just to see that authenticity. So there's this definite balance. And if you're trying, you'll never get it perfect. Um, Like with my last book, I finally said to the editor, please don't send it back to me because I will find something else to correct and I will never get it done. It's good enough the way it is now. And then I released it. (laughs) I love that so much. Oh my gosh. I mean, because there's the, there's the sort of assumption that most people have is the more effort, the higher the quality. Right. And I mean, I can, I can understand that 
that is true sometimes, obviously. I mean, particularly, okay, let's say, for example, um, well, I mean, I was going to say video editing, but writing is the same way. You can always go back and polish something more, you know, you know, right. you know, upgrade the story or add a story, add an example, you know, uh, change the change the phrasing of, of many things, change, you know, come up with an even better title. There's always more effort that can be put into any piece. And supposedly it goes, it gets higher quality. And then, you know, um, there, there's, there's, you know, there's well-known uh, creators who say you'd rather spend, you know, 20 hours making an awesome piece of content than, you know, 20 minutes, right. You know, creating up or 20 minutes per content and doing a bunch, but you, your, your example, just, you know, the, the 22 minute writing um, is, is a great example of that. And I've had the same experience too. I've spent a lot of time on certain right. things and then it just falls flat. Whereas there are certain things I'm like kind of off the cuff, but it's really, it's real for me. Right. Um, and, 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 and even sometimes I see something that's obvious to me. I'm like, I haven't seen this said very much. It's really obvious to me. I'm going to say it. And then mm -hmm. <laughs> people share it. And so this is really, really interesting. And, and this is why I, I like to talk about like the three stages of content creation, you know, stage one being exploratory, the very first time a piece of content touches mm -hmm. any other human being outside my own head. I call it stage one, whether I spend eight hours on it or eight minutes on it. It's stage one. It's, it's, right. I don't know if it's going to fall flat or if it's going to go by. I don't know. And so I, I better spend less time on stage one. And then, and then I look at a bunch of my stage one things and go, oh, that, that one did really well. Take that one, polish it some more. And then now it's stage two because I distribute more places. So I'm, not, I'm like, that makes more sense to me. Whereas people are spending so much time on their stage one. But anyway, I, I, I'm so glad that you, you're giving these examples and, and the whole thing about don't send, you know, don't send the book back to me, which by the way, you're, you're about to launch your third book, third book, third book. Yes. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. And um, I want to talk about that. So, well, actually be before we get to the third book, I, I just want to wrap up this thing about creating and having mm -hmm. a family. I often hear people go, Okay, I I'm, I can't have un uninterrupted time because I'm a caretaker, mm -hmm. and you know it's, usually it's like them taking care of one person, and now here here you are taking care of like you know 50, 50 people. Now, um, so how do you have uninterrupted or focused time to create? I mean, and and there's there's two there's two uh, questions here. One is how do you deal with interruptions and distractions, mm -hmm. and maybe a more important one is how do you deal with I guess maybe the guilt of I should be doing something for my family right now. There's more important things. Here I am writing a blog post. <laughs> like people, people kind of dismiss that as well. That's way less important than taking care of my family right now. So well, I'm going to start with the second one. <laughs> yes, so yes, yes. Because I, I, I will get to the interruptions one because yes. I, the guilt one. I, I get that, but I, I give this example a lot, and because I think it's pretty profound. My grandpa when I was growing up, he was a farmer in Southern Minnesota and we would go visit my grandpa on his farm. And when we would go to visit my grandpa in during harvest time, my grandpa was out in the fields. He was harvesting. He wasn't inside playing blocks, doing the things with us, but I never doubted my grandpa's love. Like I never thought, wow, grandpa's out working again. He doesn't love me. I, I knew it. I knew it because he was doing this act of service. So the guilt part is if my grandpa had decided, you know what, I'm just going to ignore all the work that I had done, leave the weed out there, whatever it is, just to rot for another day and then not be providing that that's not, we were all like, well, that would be ridiculous. That's he did what he needed to do. And I think as entrepreneurs and solopreneurs, sometimes we don't look at what we're doing with the same level of responsibility or the same level of, wow, that's an amazing thing is you have to be willing to harvest. You have to be willing to put all the effort in and to take the time without guilt, because that's what you're creating. This is it's work. It's a job. Uh, you know, like sometimes the kids will see us at home and they, they see us being willing to say, okay, well, we, let's go play disc golf now, or let's go do something. But they also see us during the times where we're like, you know what, this is the time we just really have to focus. We have to do this, but so they see the balance. And so the guilt part is there's no guilt in creating a business, in creating something that provides for your family in, and in doing something like that. And it's, it, you would be doing yourself a disservice 
to not do what you need to do. If you're busy in areas that aren't the space that you need to be busy in, that's when you need to write. You need to, you know, maybe wonder, am I busy in the right spot right now? The interruptions. And and just, just on this one, um, this is, I love this. I love what you said about, about the harvesting uh, example. Mm -hmm. What's particularly challenging is when someone is still at the beginning stages, Mm -hmm. when it doesn't look like a harvest action, right? right? You're like, mom, what what are you doing? You're, you're in there doing your business, but you know, you you haven't gotten any clients yet. Or like, like if you were, if you were preparing for a client meeting, okay, Hey, listen, I'm preparing for a client meeting. This is bringing in money and, Mm -hmm. but it's like, if you're, Oh, if you're setting up your website or you're, or maybe setting up your website, it even sounds more legit, but like, Mom, you're just doing your 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 writing. What what's what's the point of that? Right. Not. I mean, hopefully your your kids aren't aren't so snooty and and, and would say something like that. But some some are. But but or even friends. so, what's, yeah. or friends or friends mm-hmm. exactly like looking down or family members going, hey, you know what? Mm-hmm. Why don't you just stop doing this thing? Don't worry about it. Just just go and take care of the family. Let let me if if someone is lucky enough to have a partner who is bringing in money. That's that's also hard because like listen, I'm bringing the money. You're supposed to be taking care of the family. Stop doing this side thing, right? That's right. that's a that's a that's a big issue for some people. But some people are are single mothers, um, single right. parents, and that's 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 super challenging because it's like no, I I I should be taking care. Of, should be working with them on their homework. I should be. There's a million things that I could be doing. Working with them on their extracurriculars or whatever. Their future mm-hmm. is much more important than mine. And so, what am I doing? Doing this long term project, for example, of content creation. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a picture about? of myself sitting at the top of my stairs when I was in my single mom phase, uh, sitting at the top of my stairs outside of my two boys' bedrooms who were maybe three and six or four and six at that time because they didn't want to stay in their bedroom. And I knew I had to write and it was bedtime. And so I wrote, I actually wrote on the top of the stairs. I just sat there until they fell asleep and I, I did the work there. And I think that's the part with interruptions is when you think I can only work when I have zero interruptions, you'll never get, you'll never work because life is full of interruptions. Life is full of unexpected. And it's more about using the time as a content creator. And as a creator, I understand the, the diligence it takes to get into that flow state. Like it, sometimes it can feel like I am just wasting my time. And it's accepting the uncomfortable to get to the place where you're you're there. And that means being willing to not feel guilty about it. Because sometimes it looks like I'm doing nothing. I'm scrolling the internet. I'm, I'm just sitting there doodling. But it takes that amount of space for my brain to switch gears into where it needs to go. And if I never allow myself that space, I won't get there. So as far as interruptions, you just you have to just be willing to go with the flow and, or allow yourself to step out for a little bit. Um, I need to go create for two hours and then do that, do that. Give your hour to get to flow an hour to create. Um, because otherwise I, I know for myself, I, I could just, I always put it off till tomorrow. I'll do it someday. I'll do it someday. Sorry about that's the rescue dog right and there. And you've got your dog too. Right? Yeah, there he, is, the there he is. There he is right there. Right. Someone like talk the about interruptions, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. so, but, but this is, this is amazing. I mean, just, just to hear you say that you are able and willing to carve out two hours, <laughs> mm-hmm. two hours in a row, uh, being, being a mother of some, you know, all these kids and, and all this household stuff you have to take care of two hours, but that's powerful. I mean, I think that's, that's a great example. And I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to bring up your example again and again in the future. <laughs> um, okay. So. Uh, we've talked about creating content and now I want to like switch gears a little bit to talk about, um, creating offers. Actually, I just realized something I, I, I want to, uh, there's something else I'm going to go before, before we talk about offers, um, and then your offers as well. Um, mm-hmm. you, in your new book, I think it's in your new book that you tell the story of the thousand miles. Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, a couple of years ago, you, you set this goal. I think your, your husband may have, you know, say, well, why don't you run a thousand? Like you were already doing running every, you were already running on a regular basis. And then, and then you said, oh, what about a thousand miles? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's a cool, that's a really cool goal. Um, and so you did it and, and tell us how you were able to do that. Cause again, you're, you're busy. You got a lot to take care of and it's great that you care about your fitness. So, but, but you weren't going to be running a thousand miles that year. 
So what, what, what happened? Uh, I wasn't. So it, it was in 2022. So in the year prior, uh, my daughter left, was training for going for basic training. So I ran with her. So she didn't get there with nothing. And I started running again. Well, that year I ended up running like 365 miles. So then the next year I thought I'm going to run the distance between my house and my parents' house. So this is kind of in the middle of COVID and I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and my parents live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I needed to prove to myself that if everything else went crazy, I could actually get to my parents' house. Like I could, it would take me a long time, but I could make it. And so I set this goal to run. It was 899 miles. And I started on this journey. I, I shared updates on Facebook where I would show like with the map, Google maps, like how far I had gone each month and people, they loved it. It was so, they just thought it was so cool. Well, then I got a little bit confident. I was like, I am way ahead of schedule because I would run extra. And my husband, Dan is like, well, why don't you just run a thousand miles? And I was like, well, that's too far. I mean, real, I'm 101 miles more. And he goes, what have you figured out how much farther it is? And I said, well, I don't know. And I, I figured out the math and it was that I had to run 0.3 miles more every day. Well, 0.3 miles meant that I would just run around the block a different way. And it would, I could do it. So I ended up switching the goal, kept the one 899, which was very cool because the last mile I was actually in Minneapolis and I made it so that I ran it physically from the entrance of my parents' neighborhood to their driveway, which was unbelievable. And then the remaining one, I just decided I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Well, what I started to do was look for extra tenths of a mile everywhere I could. I would run an extra cul-de-sac here. I would um, you know, go a different little bit, a little through a parking lot once because I realized all those tenths of a mile add up. And if I can do 10 of them, I have got a mile without even thinking and feeling like I did a mile. Because if you were to say to me, why don't you add a mile to your run? I'd be like, oh, I don't know. But a 10th, I could do that in 10 days. I'm, do, I'm adding all this I'm building up all the resources without actually putting in, feeling like I was putting a lot more effort in. And it inspired me because I thought this is life and business is how many times can we just do just one more email, just another call? Uh, I, or I'll tell my kids, you know, the difference between throwing your clothes on the floor versus the 10 seconds to put them up and put it away will save you hours when I say clean your room. So it was looking at life differently and trying to find those extra tenths wherever I could. I love this so much. So inspiring. I mean, getting goosebumps thinking about this. Um, and it actually, it's funny, it's a, it applies to something that I've been doing with my content, actually. So the first place I put my content is, uh, it always surprises people, but it's on Twitter. Uh, now, awesome. Now known as X. And the reason, yes. and, and it's funny because I, I, for a while, I actually subscribed to the paid Twitter where it gave you more features. Like instead of 280 characters, you would have like, you can write as long as you want to basically an article as a, as a tweet. Right. But then I went back and, and, then I'm, and then I realized I'm not using any of the other paid features. And also there's a certain, I, I like the constraint of 280 characters mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. because it allows me to go, I don't have to write a long article right now. I can just share a thought, a quick thought, it, it, and no matter how imperfect it is, because well, you know, Twitter, lots of imperfect right. thoughts on there. And so it's like, that's how I've been creating content. I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I made a commitment and, you know, every day, Monday through Friday, I'm going to show up and I'm going to just draft a thought. And if I have some other idea later in the day, I will add it to that same thread. Um, Ooh, and cool. so that becomes a Twitter thread. And it's like, it's it's just like your one tenth of a mile thing. I could just mm -hmm. yeah, let me let me tap a few more words into there. Oh yeah, I have another follow up idea to that. Okay, tap a few more words, and then it becomes this long enough Twitter thread, which then I can take into a blog post and just fill That's in awesome. a few more. Words. <laughs> you know. Anyway, so this is yeah. Thank you, for, thank you for that story, and uh, I'm sure you have other amazing stories in, in 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 the book that's coming out. I'll be sure to put the put the link below as well. Um, okay, so speaking of books. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about offers and, you know, the products and services that, that you've created over the years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I guess I don't know where, where we want to start, but, but um, like, do you offer services like coaching? Uh, tell us about what it is that you you've created. All right. Well, 
again, it's listening. So one of the things that happened to me was about a de- over a decade ago, I started attending blogging conferences and learning and because I needed to, you have to keep learning. You have to, everything's changing. And so I started doing that. Well, what ended up happening was people started asking me, how did you grow your Facebook page? How did you grow an audience? And as a result, I started, people would say, could you come talk to our conference about this? Could you share about what it takes? And the, my initial step into that world was um, my husband. Uh, this is before we were married. We would start, we started teaching and training bloggers and entrepreneurs, how do you, how to create it, move from a hobby to a full-time business? Because we had seen that most people have that 18 month curve and then you, you get that threshold where you're like, well, it's not really working. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want to do. And we were like, how do we help them go from that place on? And so over the years, I, I developed these two parts of what I was doing. I continued to grow Finding Joy, continued to do speaking, which was an offer. Like people would say, could you come speak to our mom's group? Could you come speak to, I, I spoke for the state of Arkansas about money and finances. And I had that facet, but then I also had the facet of, can you help me with my business? And so my husband, Dan and I, besides doing a bunch of products and BC stack and a a bunch of marketing things, also we have a high-end mastermind called the Orange Circle, where we, we, we actually work hand in hand with entrepreneurs on how do I get from this plateau to the next? Because the truth is, no matter where you are in business, you're going to hit a spot and it's not your job to stop at that plateau is to figure out what's next. And that's what I feel like both he and I are really good at seeing and helping somebody else see it. It's one thing to just say, this is what you need to do. But when you can lead somebody to that place where they're like, oh, that is exactly what I need to do. Then it becomes, it's their idea. It's their passion. And it's much more successful than just saying step one is this step four is this. It's guiding somebody to the next place. I love that. You're essentially a coach (laughs) at that point of helping the client find their own inspiration, find their own answer. Um, So back to this idea of creating your offers, you obviously have some offers that are quite successful now. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure uh, you've created offers over the years that have flopped, have been unsuccessful, haven't done as well, haven't launched as well as you, you, you hoped. Um, all of us who have made it more than a few years have have, have you know stories like that. So speak to those who are currently. I guess I I guess I maybe have I have two questions for you. One, speak to those who are currently um, trying to figure out what offer they should create. What is what what should my service be? Uh, what right. should my or or actually the most the most common situation that I come across is they they already had some idea. They launched, it, they tried to sell it. And even if they like, for example, took a poll of people mm-hmm. and to say, oh, which one of these should I offer? And then people, oh, that one. And then nobody bought it. <laughs> even mm-hmm. even, the, mm-hmm. even the, the 15 poll takers that didn't buy it. So speak to those who have tried selling something, gotten discouraged and saying, well, just, does that mean no one wants what I have? Okay. Um, yeah. let's just stay, stay with this one, this, because that's a very common situation. And, and, you know, even if someone is just starting out, that's going to be an experience that, that, that you're going to have sometime probably soon. And how did you, how, how do you, how do you metabolize and, 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 and learn from those situations? And then how do you move forward? Well, it goes back to that speed bump analogy. Uh, if somebody, if no one buys it, then it's just feedback instead of it being a critique about who you are or what your worth is, or I'm not good enough or nobody likes it. It could be something I'm going to give an example of a post of mine that went viral. It could be a very small tweak that needs to be made, but if you throw it all out and without trying to figure it out, you might be losing something. So about eight years ago or so I had written a post and I thought it was great. And I, it, it had an ebook offer at the end, but the post itself, um, this is when I was getting a lot of ad revenue. So I needed people to come to the site and the post, it just, it did okay. And then about a year later, I looked at it and I was like, this is really good. And all I did was change the image that parsed on Facebook, changed it. And I, I changed the text like the, so it was a little bit more compelling. 
And it immediately went viral. I mean, crazy. And I think to myself, if I had just said none of it works, it was no good, didn't learn from it, then I wouldn't have gotten to the place where that went viral, which taught me it was uh, the post was called I Forgot How to Be the Happy Mom, which also gave me great insight into an entire bucket and funnel on my website about being happy. But if I, again, had decided it didn't work, and I'm not going to use it, uh, then I would have been, I would have, I would have missed out. So you're going to have offers that don't work and you're going to have things. And it's not necessarily that it's not the right thing. It might just be the wrong phrasing. It might be the wrong image. It might be too much, which is another thing that I think is really important. I, I really feel like when we're starting, we think we need to give them everything and it's too much. People have already too much. I really believe at least for my audience, simpler, the better. This, when it's straightforward, this is what you get. And you're un, just kind of unapologetic. It's easier. So it's being willing to say that's too much or, or maybe you as the creator have put so much into it. And there's this little bit of hesitation. Can I deliver all of that? And when there's the hesitation, then your audience will feel it as well. So I always like to say, really look through what you're offering. Can you sustain this a year from now? two years from now or whatever it is. And what's the exit plan for your offering? Because if you don't know that part too, then you have that little bit of angst there, which people pick up on. Mm, I love that. So, you know, you have seems to me at least two markets, right? You've mm -hmm. got the sort of entrepreneur, solopreneur market where you, you guys have um, courses and products to help them yep. with their marketing, with their, with their tech, um, sort of entrepreneurial mindset yep. stuff as well. And then you've got the moms that you're addressing, mm -hmm. you know, women and moms that you're addressing. Um, do you see that as two markets? Like, but tell me about that because <clears throat> Because, well, you people typically say you got you to niche yourself and just focus on one niche. Um, but you have at least two niches. I do. Yeah. I, I actually love that I do because I practice what I preach in some ways. So if I'm going to talk about audience growth with, uh, with a, a team of people, I actually can say, all right, here's, the, here's my site. I've grown it. I've done this all for Facebook. I've, I've grown all organically. I haven't paid them anything. Facebook actually pays me now as a content creator. And I love that I have the hands-on experience to back up what I'm teaching. And that to me is huge. I, uh, to have that experience, that knowledge, the what it's like to create the email list and the funnel and all the different aspects of it, I believe makes me a better coach a better person to teach about audience growth because I've actually done the work to do it. And that's the, the, it inspires me because I've, I've gone through that journey to be able to share it. Now, is there a crossover? Absolutely. But not every woman, mom, person that comes to finding joy is an entrepreneur. So I, I know that I know that it's a subsection within there, but I love, I mean, I, I, I get a super on fire when I get to talk about the entrepreneurial part, because it's the part of the story that changed my life is really deciding I'm not going to let whatever algorithm change stop me. Yeah. And, um, and the mom niche um, mm -hmm. has, I've long seen so many people try to make a business work serving moms. Uh, understandably, mm -hmm. they have, they, they have been moms themselves and they know how challenging it was and they've overcome um, you know, important hurdles. And then now they want to help other moms do the same thing, whether it's just mindset or with lifestyle or with your organization or whatever it may be. And I've always seen that it's, it seems to me really challenging to get moms to pay for support for themselves, for coaching, for right. courses, for masterminds or whatever. Have you seen that to be the case? And how do you work with that, that, that niche? I think there's a place for everything. Like everybody spends money where they see the value. Um, somebody could say it's too expensive. And then the next in, in an hour, be in line at Starbucks for something for 685. So it's all a matter of perceived value and what you're giving and can it meet them where it is? So for me, I, do I have stuff that's free? Because there are some moms that they just, I know they don't have that resource and I just want to give them. And 
but then there's other stuff that costs it. So it's about scaling it and meeting your audience where it is. And I, I really go back to that with your content creating or product creating or offer. It's understanding your audience, knowing who they are, where they shop, what they spend, you know, getting that avatar, that, that idea of who they are. So you meet them with what they need versus trying to convince them of something that they need that they might not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that. I say to people like market discovery or market research is really about understanding the buying patterns of your mm -hmm. audience so that you can ask yourself, how might I fit into their existing buying patterns? Because to change someone's habit or buying pattern, well, it's like changing anybody's habit. Um, right. they're, they're, it's, they're are, they've created this groove, this deep groove of how they spend their money and how they, it's like, if you're going to change how they spend money, it's really hard. But if you can fit yourself into whatever it else they're already buying. So, so on that note, like, what do you, what have you found that your audience of moms like to buy? I'm curious. Well, what's interesting about my audience is they're looking for the encouragement aspect because I'm not selling besides the books. I'm not really selling a physical product. I'll have t-shirts every once in a while or quotes. What they're looking for is the reminder that they're capable, that they're, that they know that they're enough and that they can do amazing things. And so for my audience, I know specifically that's what they gravitate towards. They would gravitate towards items and courses and books about self-discovery and not just self-discovery about mindset and visualization and kind of that underdog story. And they want encouragement. So that's, that's the space that they're in. You know, people have come to me like with recipes or these ideas or organization, and I'll tell them, I, I love it. I think it's important, but that's not who my audience is. I'll refer them to them if they ask for it, which I think is the greatest part about business is knowing that if that's not your space is forming a partnership with somebody that I can say, Hey, you know what? I appreciate you reaching out to me. Here's a friend of mine. I'd love to refer you to them. And they're great. Or I'll get like, how come you don't write about dads? And I'll say, well, because I am a mom and I think it would be a disservice for me to write from the perspective of knowing what a dad goes through, but here's friends of mine that have a great website and I'd love to refer you. Yeah. I love that. An ecosystem of support, uh, right. mutual support. And of course, you know, you referring people creates a natural reciprocity back as well. Um, right. Okay, so let's let's wrap up the conversation. Um, looking at uh, solopreneurs again, and okay. if if people if people were interested, I mean, you've already mentioned some of your offerings, but but uh, let's 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 make it simpler. If people want to uh, work with you or get your guidance as a solopreneur, um, mm -hmm. what is the next step? It would be to, to reach out to us at, uh, you can email me at rachel at findingjoy.net or it's the orange circle. If you search that with audience industries, my husband and I, we open it, I believe twice a year. Sometimes it's once a year because it's a huge commitment. And for us, because we're, we're all in, um, but we're looking at starting a new group in October. Okay. Awesome. I will be sure to put the orange circle, um, which is the, the, the solopreneur group that your uh, mastermind that you're forming. I'll put that mm -hmm. uh, at, in the link below. Um, well, anything else you want to be sure to say as we wrap up this, uh, this conversation? Well, you know what, actually, I, I just want everybody that's listening that thinks, I don't know if I'm cut out for this or it's not working, or I just want them to step back and realize what an amazing thing it is to be able to have the opportunity to create. Uh, I think sometimes we forget that in the busy, in the grind and the grit of it. But I, I'm constantly a champion. I champion this for moms. I champion it for entrepreneurs and anybody that for most of his, human history, we've wanted a voice and we wanted the ability to express ourselves, to create, and people have fought for this for us. And we have it right here in this amazing internet, in our brains, in all of this. And when you have those moments of discouragement or it's not working, I just want to encourage you that Every time you decide, you know, I'm going to try it again, you ultimately are changing the lives of somebody else by allowing your unique genius and your creativity to come into the world. Ah, what a, what a wonderful uh, reminder and a place for us to complete. Rachel, thank you so much. It's been inspiring to talk with you. And 
I, you know, folks, please comment below if you like and share with us what was one takeaway that that you got from this and um, be sure to check out the links for Rachel below. So thank you Thank so much, you. Rachel. Thank you.